A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitani Rajeem Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim I start in the name of Allah, the Beneficent and the Merciful. I seek salvation from Shaitan the Accursed. My dearest viewers, my brothers and sisters from all around the world, Assalamu Alaikum Jami'an wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. May the peace, the blessings and the protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be with you at all times. I would like to thank you once again for joining us here on Imam Hussain TV for the Ramadan show with me, your host, Dr. Shabir Tijani. Inshallah, we will impart some more pearls of wisdom to you to be a one-stop shop for this holy month. I would like to humbly once again request you to send in your videos and your pictures about how you prepare yourself on a day-to-day -day basis for this holy month. Once again, you can join the debate on Twitter using the hashtag IHTVRamadan. Please like our page on Facebook and join us on Instagram and on YouTube where inshallah this program will be uploaded tomorrow. Before proceeding on to the show, I wanted to remember a quote from Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam where he says, the value of a person is in the good deeds that he does. And this is so true. Our character makes up our personality. And if we have good traits and a good character, it means we have a good personality. Inshallah, let's endeavor to do this and build upon our personalities in these holy nights in this month of Ramadan. This episode, when we talk about spiritual refinement, I want to talk about that one specific dua that we should all be making, and that is to await and to prepare for and to receive the awaited Imam. May Allah hasten his reappearance. Imam Mahdi salam, is waiting for us to be ready for him, to be prepared for him to return. Inshallah, over the course of the next few minutes, I just want to talk about how we should prepare ourselves and the merits of preparing oneself for the return of the Imam. When we talk about preparing ourselves, what does that mean? We need to be ready on a number of levels, whether it's physically, mentally, emotionally, or spiritually. This doesn't mean just hitting the gym and reciting Dua Faraj every day, but it's more encompassing. For example, it's important, as other people have said, to be spiritually cleansed and spiritually empty our souls of any dirt. Try and be good Muslims, try and be good human beings. Learn more about religion, about faith. It's also good to physically prepare ourselves. So by that what I mean is eating the right things, keeping healthy, keeping active. But one other important aspect is he doesn't need to reach us, we need to reach him as well. Basically, what incentives does the Imam have to come back for our generation? How are we different from any of the other generations? Why did he leave in the first place? And what makes us so special that he should return solely for us? In this sense, if Imam Mahdi came back tomorrow, we would probably not be ready for him. With all the disunity that we have, that even the Shia community within our own communities display. We need to fix our communities before we can turn around to the Imam and say we're ready. After all, if the Imam came down today or tomorrow, it would take him probably a many, many months or years just to fix the problems of one community. Forget about the whole Ummah. So as a community, we need to be prepared. As society, we need to be prepared. And as individuals, we also need to be prepared. Some people just literally sit around and say, we need the Mahdi to come and fix our problems. We're not going to do anything. We're not going to be proactive. And that is not the mentality that one should have. The way of getting ready and prepared is to fix your own problems. Make proactive steps to improve your lives and improve the lives of your community. Fix up any disunity within the community and any negative traits within you as an individual. And then the Imam will be awaiting or coming down because we're prepared by that stage. 
during the period of Ghayba, it is the responsibility of every being, rather every believer, that he establishes a spiritual contact with the Imam of our age. Don't forget that the Imam can hear us, the Imam can see us. We just have to call out to him and he, and he will hear us and come to our aid. When a person acquires the recognition of the Imam, a unique relationship is built wherein the heart, as per its capability, becomes a reflection of the characteristics of the ethics and the values of the Imam. May Allah rehasten his reappearance. Allah the Almighty informs us in the Holy Quran, O oh, those who believe, be patient and enjoy patience amongst one another and remain in contact. And be careful of your duty to Allah lest you succeed. The above verse has been explained by the holy Imams. As all those who believe remain patient and steadfast during the period of Ghaybah, the Ghaybah of the Imam of the age. Be steadfast upon the right path as compared to your enemies and remain in contact with the awaited Imam. Obey the laws and regulation of Islam as laid down by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for surely it is in your success. Some people harbour the misconception that since we are living our lives in the period of the major occultation, it is impossible to maintain a contact with the Imam. And there is no way we can have a relationship with the Imam. It is important that we clarify this point here. As regards to the traditions that are available on this matter, it is true that during the period of major occultation, a person that claims that he can meet the hidden Imam whenever he desires is a liar. It is equally true, however, that during this period there are numerous instances of people having been blessed with a visit of the, or from the Imam of our time, may Allah hasten his reappearance, either in person or through a spiritual experience like a dream. It is not necessary that contact be maintained only by regular meetings in a person. A relationship need not be established through physical contact alone, rather a relationship through spiritual means can be created also. By this what we're saying is that have regular conversations with your Imam even if, though, even if he's not there physically. Talk to your Imam. Put your faith and your trust in your Imam because surely he's seeing you, he's hearing you. Inshallah if you do that you can feel more closeness with him even if it's not in the physical sense of the term but emotionally and spiritually you'll feel close to him. The Imam prays for us and he loves us all the time. It is said that the Imam has true affection for those that love him. He prays for those who pray for him. He has a close connection with those who regularly remember him. It is highlighted by Allama Majlisi and Muhaddith Nuri. They have both narrated that Sheikh Tusi said, One morning after Sahar I visited for offering prayers. I saw the Imam there beseeching Allah and saying, O oh Allah, our Shias have been created from our light and the remainder of our earth. They have sinned in the hope of our love and benevolence. If their sin is related to your exalted self, then you forgive them. We will be satisfied with your forgiveness. And if their sin is related to the rights of their brethren, then you correct their shortcomings and grant them from the part of Khums which is our right, so that they may be satisfied with it. Protect them from the fire of hell and do not gather them amongst our enemies in your punishment. On reflecting on the words of the Imam salam, and his prayer, we are overcome with shame and remorse. This blessed personality whose continued presence ensures our existence and our guidance in this world and its sustenance. He is the Imam of our time, Imam Mahdi. He prays for sinners like us and seeks forgiveness so that we may have salvation from the hellfire. We the sinners who are the direct recipients of his love and affection, is it right that we forget him and remove him from our remembrance, remove him from our hearts, remove him from our minds? Or rather shouldn't we ensure that we fill our hearts and minds with his remembrance to such an extent that not a moment in our life passes without his remembrance, without us constantly praying for him, remembering him, connecting to him. 
we end, or rather this segment, I want to end it with a final prayer. And that is to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the tawfiq, to develop a sincere love, sincere affection, and a sincere connection with the Imam of our time within our hearts. It has been reported on the authority of Imam Ali ibn Musa al Riva alayhi salatu wasalam, who said, If one asks why is it that the fasts were made obligatory exclusively in the month of Ramadan and not in other months, it would be said, This is because the month of Ramadan is the month in which Allah Azzawajal, had revealed the Holy Quran. In this show, as we go through the many different types of preparations for this holy month in different parts of the world, in different cities, we will come to a place called Qadhmiya. Qadhmiya is in the heartland of the city of Iraq. It's actually within the confines of the city of Baghdad. It is where the resting place of Imam Musa al-Qadhim is alayhi salam and Imam Muhammad Taqi alayhi salam. Qadhmiya is a city which is populated by many of the Shia people and the people there have a very specific way, a very specific tradition of how they commemorate and they get themselves prepared for this holy month. The people of Qadhmiya, they love their sweets and their heavy foods and they have a specific food called lablabi. I never tried it myself but the guys around me today tell me that they'll make me try it so inshallah once I try it I'll let you know how it tastes. And the people of Qadhmiya during the nights of power, during the nights of Qadr, they all go to the shrine of the seventh Imam alayhi salam, where they do their a'mal, they have majalis, they have latmiyat. And even the people of Baghdad and even further afield come and gather in this holy shrine. The special thing about the majlis during these nights are that they start at the time of iftar and they go on all the way until about 2.30 a.m. near the time of Fajr. And people at the shrine, they get fed, they have a small iftar and they enjoy and they get together and they do dua together, they supplicate together and they do the a'mal together as well. And also there is regular recitations of the Holy Quran, regular recitations of dua during this holy month within the shrine. And you'll be able to see some of these exclusively and on Imam Hussein TV. Inshallah, I hope that you can send your videos in and your pictures, your blogs about how you are spending this holy month. And we can air these videos and show the rest of the world your preparation. I find it astonishing how people come together during this month. They form a galvanized community. Yet when we look around the world, there's so many different practices based on tradition, based on backgrounds. But at the end of the day, they all come together when it comes to time for dua, time for amal, they pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they all pray for one thing and that thing is to achieve nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Ahlul Bayt alayhim as -salam. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Respected Imam Hussein TV viewers Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Peace and blessings of Allah be upon each and every one of you Again we are in one of the store markets in the holy city of Karbala to show you the last days of the holy month of Ramadan in the holy city of Karbala
dearest viewers, I have one of the brothers here. I will ask him a few questions regarding the holy month of Ramadan. Salam alaikum. Alaikum salam. Alaikum Can you tell us about the Ramadan in the city of Karbala? First, we thank the Muslims in the month of Ramadan. And the Holy Spirit here, Allah, the Holy Spirit, 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 and the Holy Spirit. And now, with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Uh, brother is uh, congratulating you on the arrival of the holy month of Ramadan and he's saying that uh, the holy city of Karbala is full of spirituality during the holy month of Ramadan and the visitors coming to the holy city and especially uh, that we are getting closer uh, to the days of the Eid al-Fitr insha'Allah. ممكن تتفضلن عن ساعات عملكم خلال شهر رمضان مبارك وشنو اللي يختلف عن بقية الأشهر؟ هو بس بشهر رمضان عملنا يصير مختلف لأن الشغل راح يصير بس وراء الفطور كأربع ساعات خمس ساعات لحد السحور هيك وبعدين كل واحد المحلات بتسكر على وقت السحور وهي خلاص. I asked him about the 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 working hours and he's saying that we usually open after the iftar and stay open until the time of the morning prayer. And almost all the stores here do the same, and uh, usually they have a rest during the day hours. During these last few episodes of health tips and medical advice, instead of focusing upon illnesses and ailments of the human body, I wanted to talk about the miracles of the human body, those systems that are in our bodies that allow us to function on a day-to-day -day basis. And when we analyze them, we realize they're nothing short of Allah's blessings, of Allah's bounties, of Allah's miracles. Today, I'm going to talk about the excretory systems of the body. I know that on the face of it, it probably doesn't sound like a pleasant thing to talk about, but really it is one of the most amazing things in the human body. When I talk about excretory systems, I'm, I'm not, not going to talk about all of them, but just two of the main ones. Two of the systems which actually help us to continue living and remove toxins out of our bodies, and those are the kidneys and the liver. The first organ I want to talk about is the kidney. The human kidney is so super specialized for its job that it's one of the three main organs in our body, along with the heart and along with the brain. The kidney, when we look at it, on the face of it, it may seem like a, an organ that we don't want to think about because it does such a, a, well, some people think it does a disgusting job, but actually it's so beautiful in the way it's created, in the way it works, in the way it's so specialized for its job. It does so many different things, from things such as, or simple things such as absorbing water and salts into the system, to very, very complex things like managing the acid and base balance of the blood, make sure the blood is not too acidic. And it also makes sure that your blood pressure is right and there isn't any fluctuations in the blood pressure itself. Other things it does is it absorbs sugars back into the system if there's any sugar to be found within the kidney or within the actual tubules of the kidney. And finally, it works with other hormones such as um, angiotensin, such as antidiuretic hormone, and as a result, it allows us to maintain our fluid balance in our bodies. And that's why the kidneys are so specialized at fluid balance and managing fluid balance. Inshallah, over the next few minutes, I just want to talk about the role of the kidneys, the different parts of the kidneys and how they work. The first part of the kidney is actually before the kidney. And that is the blood supply to the kidney. The renal artery supplies the blood to the kidneys. And it's a very important blood vessel because without it, and without the blood supply to the kidneys, the kidneys would fail and we wouldn't be able to ma manage the fluid balance within our bodies. We wouldn't be able to manage the blood pressure within our bodies. So it's such an important artery. The blood passes over the glomerulus, which is like a filter, which is like a sieve essentially. Things that are not allowed to pass through it are things like large proteins, are things like red blood cells. 
And as a result, the things on the other side of the sieve or the glomerulus are fluid, are salt, are sugars sometimes. And they have a very specific role when we talk about the kidney in itself. The kidney then, um, you get to the proximal tubule. The proximal tubule has a very simple job, but it's so specialized for its job. And that job is to take in sugars and salt into the bloodstream. And as a result, the fluid follows the, the gradient for osmosis. Once salt and sugars are taken out and moved into the blood system, the, the fluid, the water travels by simple osmosis into the blood system also. It's a very simple theory, but it works so perfectly. After that, we get to the loop of Henle. The loop of Henle is a very, very complex part of the kidney in itself. The reason being that in the proximal tubule where things passed through osmosis and they moved from the tube into the blood vessel, in the loop of Henle, things work slightly differently. In the loop of Henle, we have to push the salt out against the osmotic gradient using a thing called active transport. And this happens within the cells as a result because we're pumping out salts into the blood system to create a concentration gradient for further on, which I'll talk about. The reason, the, the problem is that you have to use energy. And this is why this specific part of the kidney is so super specialized at what it does, because it pumps out large volumes or large quantities of potassium, of sodium, and of chloride. And as a result, once the system, or once the, 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 the fluid in the tubule is devoid of these salts, it then passes on to the distal tubule, where as a result there's a large osmotic gradient between the actual um, the, the fluid inside the duct and the fluid in the blood vessel. And therefore the fluid inside the duct can pass very comfortably from the tubule into the blood vessel. In the distal tubule you also find that you have a salt transporter, the potassium and sodium transporter, which moves sodium and potassium around in the body based on the needs of the body. So we have here um, another hormone that acts upon this part of the, uh, of, the, of the kidney and that's called aldosterone. And again, that's produced in a different part of the body called the adrenal gland. And depending on how much the body needs the salts and how much the body needs the fluid, it will actually either cause there to be more production of aldosterone or less production of aldosterone. I don't have time to talk about this hormone, but it's a very specialized hormone and it works on the distal tubule. And therefore we find that the salts are absorbed in the right amounts and if there's more salts that are not needed by the body, they're excreted in, in the right amounts. Finally, the, body, the, the fluid moves into the collecting ducts, which is the last part of the kidney system. And that is known, oh, that has something called aquapores in it, which are controlled by a hormone called antidiuretic hormone. This hormone is produced when, for example, you get thirsty. Diuresis means passing of urine. Antidiuretic hormone is something that does the opposite, so it keeps fluid in the system, therefore passing less out in the form of urine. And antidiuretic hormone is produced in the brain, and the triggers for that are things like your circulating blood volume, the amount of thirst you have, so things like the thirst, the thirst on your tongue, or the dryness of your tongue is actually controlled by many, many different factors as well. Not just the fact that you feel thirsty, but also it's not because your, your mouth is dry, but because also in your brain you're feeling thirsty. And this is all controlled by this specific hormone. Finally, once the um, fluid is absorbed through the aquapores via this specialized hormone, it passes through the renal pelvis and out into the ureters, into the bladder, and then out through, through the urethra and there's an opening and it passes out via urine. It's such a super specialized system and that's how the excretion happens. The kidney also has very specialized systems of monitoring blood pressure. And once, it's blood pressure, once the blood pressure has been found or has been monitored, it produces a hormone called, um, it, well, it's actually a complex hormone system called the renin-angiotensin system. And it affects this system and therefore this system controls the blood pressure. Other things that it controls that has um, sensors that trigger once the hydrogen levels are too high or too low. The hydrogen ions are the things that control the acidity of the blood. And as a result, it acts as a buffer if there's too much hydrogen ions in the blood system. It actually produces more bicarbonate in order to 
neutralize the acid. However, if there's too little um, hydrogen ions, it produces less um, bicarbonate. And as a result, you get less buffering. And therefore, the system, the human body, and the blood is kept at a neutral pH. Next, I'm just going to talk about the liver very, very quickly. The liver is found in the right upper quadrant or the right top part of the abdomen. The role of the liver is very specialized to what it does. The liver gets the blood system or the blood perfusion from the gut and it goes via something called a first pass metabolism. That means that when the food is absorbed through the gut, it goes via simple blood systems into the liver itself where any toxins are taken out. And that's why some medications we have to take orally, we can't inject them, we can't give them via other ways because in order for the um, tablet to become active, it needs to actually go through the liver and then once it's excreted out of the liver, once it's gone into the blood system from the liver, it actually becomes active. And therefore we find that the liver is so specialized, it's got cells called hepatocytes and very specific enzymes in them, enzymes such as P450, and these actually work with the toxins or they, they bind onto the toxins or they change the structure of the toxins so that it can be excreted out of the body and it doesn't become harmful to the human body. The other thing that the liver does is it um, metabolizes cholesterol and bile. The role of bile is that it emulsifies fats that are in the gut. So the liver produces bile, excretes it out via the um, ducts into the gallbladder and when the body is ready or once there is fat in the system the bile duct uh, sorry the gallbladder passes the bile out via the bile duct into the duodenum which is a part of the small intestine and therefore can emulsify the fats there and absorb the fats in the right amounts inshallah even though this has been a very very brief coverage of these excretory mechanisms the human body is truly beautiful. Even something that we feel is so disgusting, we may feel repulsed at the sound of these excretory systems. But really, without them, we would not be alive. Without them, we would not be able to function. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed so many beautiful system in so many beautiful systems in total equilibrium within our bodies that without one of them, we would not be able to survive. Yet we live up to the ripe age of sometimes 70, 80, 90, and even some of us up to the age of 100, with these organs all working in pure and perfect synchrony throughout our lives. And that in itself is a miracle. So inshallah, I hope that you appreciate these miracles through these nights. Thank Allah for these miracles and look after yourselves. Imam Hussain, peace be upon him, is known is, and is very well known for his kindness, charity, and love for the poor. One day, when Imam Hussain, peace be upon him, was riding his horse through his horse through the seats of Medina, he came across some beggars who were gathered around to eat their food that they begged for during the day. When they saw the Imam, they invited him to, to join them. Imam Hussain, peace be upon him, was not allowed to take anything given in charity, also known as sadaqah, as he was the family and he was a member of uh, the family of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Sadaqah is forbidden, also known as haram, for the members of Ahlul Bayt, as well as the descendants of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Imam Hussein still, even though Imam Hussein still got off his horse and sat down with the beggars, Imam Hussein politely explained to them by saying that although he would love to eat with them, but since he is a, a member of Ahlul Bayt, he cannot accept charity. As an alternative, Imam Hussain, peace be upon him, invited all the beggars to his house for food so they can all join together and eat together. The moral of the story is that we should always be kind to one another, especially the poor, because we should, we should not compromise our beliefs for anyone, but at the same time, we should always be polite in how we express ourselves.
Inshallah, today during the poetry, I want to recite and remember the story of Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam. You see, because the remembrance of him is the beating heart of the Shia nation. And it is said that if you ask for any forgiveness, ask for anything, anything with the wasila of Imam Al Hussein, you'll surely get it. On these nights where we remember our sins, remember the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we ask for forgiveness. Remember the, remember the grief and the pain of Hussein alayhi salam and surely forgiveness will be yours. This is a poem that was originally written in Farsi. It's called Hussein Vai. And we've translated it or converted it into English, me and myself, uh, sorry, me and my brother Abbas. Inshallah, I hope you listen to it and you remember Imam al Hussein. You cry and you remember your own sins whilst you're doing it. We can't control, we can't control the, the tears that tears flow. That Oh Master, oh, we Master, all we want you to want know, you to know. The, flame the flame of your love will always glow. Will always glow. In, our In our hearts it will only, will only grow. grow. Today your Today name your runs name in our veins. veins. When our, when our heart, beats, heart beats, it beats your it name. Beats your On name. our On lips our is Hussein, Hussein. When we hear when we of hear your grief and pain, Hussein, why, 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 Hussein, The brother that she did so adore, the one that she did love to her core, the heart of Zainab stopped when she saw your headless body upon the floor to trample you on. The horses rushed beneath their hooves, all your bones were crushed. From every piece of body blood gushed Your daughter cried with a heart so crushed Hussein, why, why, why Hussein, why, why It has been reported on the authority of Imam Ali ibn Musa al Rida alayhi salatu wasalam, who said, if one asks why is it that the fasts were made obligatory exclusively in the month of Ramadan and not in other months, it would be said, this is because the month of Ramadan is the month in which Allah Azzawajal had revealed the Holy Quran. As we reach the end of another show, I would like to once again share something that I've been thinking about, something to get you to reflect and to contemplate. And that is that if you stop focusing on every grain of sand in your path, you will soon realize that you have a whole desert to cross. Sometimes in our lives we're so overcome with the little obstacles, we forget that we actually have a long journey ahead and we have to reach our destiny but we get so caught up in these individual obstacles that we waste our time. I would like to once again thank you for watching the show and inshallah we hope we've been able to impart some pearls of wisdom for you and for your holy month of Ramadan. I would like to ask you to send in your pictures, your videos, your blogs and inshallah we can air them on our show. Don't forget to join us on social media as well. 
Finally, I would ask you to please remember us in your du'as and also pray for the reappearance of the Holy Twelfth Imam, alayhi salam. I wish, you, I wish to bid you farewell with the following words. Wassalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.